Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining. My name is Curtis Sherholtz, and I'm going to be doing the presenting today. And I've got Mark Norris and Scott as well for backup. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them in the question and answer box. That way we can type a response and we can also email out a list of the questions in the answers to all the participants afterwards. We can also email a PDF version of the presentation. So thanks everyone again for joining me. And today I'm gonna to be doing a presentation on the Wiesman domestic hot water tanks. So these are all stainless steel indirect hot water tanks. So we do have some updates to the lineup. So the updated products are the single coil cylinders, 42, 53 and 79 gallon tanks, as well as the dual coil 79 gallon tanks. The 120 gallon tanks were updated in and around 2018. The updates include improved standby losses due to a thicker, higher performance insulation. And this insulating process is now fully automated for higher product quality assurance. The cylinders are now in the new Vito Pearl white color. So this is going to match the new Vito Dens E3 boiler lineup. We have a new temperature measurement system, so a new system for mounting the sensors, and I'll go through that in some detail, as well as electronic thermometers and accessories. It is a new stainless steel that is being used in these tanks. So this is AISI 444, and that is a low carbon, low nitrogen ferritic stainless steel. So the advantages of this, it has superior pitting in crevice corrosion resistance and superior corrosion resistance in chlorinated material. There have been 80,000 or more tanks installed and out in the field with no corrosion problems thus far. As far as testing the cylinders, Wiesman has gone well above and beyond with testing these cylinders. They've tested them to 754 PSI. The general rule of thumb for testing a pressure vessel is 1.5 times its max uh, pressure that it will see. Well, if these tanks are paired with 150 PSI pressure relief valve, then that would have been 225 pounds. So they've exceeded well and beyond that. So key features are, we have the entire water content heated by a nice wide diameter inch and three eighths stainless steel heat exchanger. And this coil extends all the way down to the bottom of the tank. By taking the coil all the way down to the bottom of the tank, we're able to heat the entire water content and therefore can pull 82 to 97% of the tank volume at a constant water temperature. The stainless steel heat exchanger is auto vented upwards. So that is preventing any air locks from getting inside the heat exchanger. And the largest tank, the 119 gallon tank comes with a removable soft PET insulation. Uh, to say removable might be a little misleading. It's actually shipped separately. So it doesn't come shipped on the tank. It comes shipped separately. The reason for this is with the insulation on that tank will be a little over 34 inches wide, but with the insulation off, it's just under 24 inches and can easily get through any narrow hallways or doorways. As far as warranty is concerned, we have a lifetime warranty for residential use to the original owner, eight years commercial warranty to the original owner, and two years on the insulation jacket and any accessories. Kind of breaking down the model lineup, the smallest two tanks, the 42 and 53 gallon tanks are available only as a single coil tank and they come in the Vito Pearl white jacket as mentioned. The 79 gallon tank, we introduced the dual coil option into that size and it again will be in the Vito Pearl white jacket. And the largest tank, the 119 gallon tank is available again in single or dual coil. And this comes in a gray jacket. The general idea to me being that the residential products, which would most likely be paired with the smaller tanks are going to be in that Vito Pearl white color as where our commercial boilers tend to be in the gray color as where the larger tanks will be more likely to be used. Taking a look at an example of a table that you'll find in the product data, I just want to kind of break down how you would read this table. It's fairly self-explanatory, but you've got your model number and your tank size here at the top. And then you've got your GPM flow rate through the heat exchanger and your 
tank, or sorry, your boiler supply water temperature. So as an example, if I had 176 degree supply water temperature and a flow of 8.8, I could achieve 134 gallons per hour continuous draw, and that would require 100,000 BTU. I've kind of highlighted this number off to the side here to make an example. So if, let's just say we had a situation where you needed 150 gallon per hour continuous draw, which works out to about 2.5 GPM. And let's just imagine we were pairing this to say 150,000 BTU veto dense boiler. Well, if I look at this table and I know I need 150 GPH, I can see that I have to be at the 194 degree water temperature. I could achieve this at 4.4 GPM. That's gonna give me a Delta T of approximately 51 degrees Fahrenheit and a return water in and around the 143 degree range. So this will work. The customer will get the hot water that they require, but you're gonna lose some efficiency out of that boiler because you're kind of above the ideal return water temperature to take advantage of the condensing aspect of a condensing boiler. If you upsize the tank in the same application to a 79 gallon tank, which isn't gonna have any bigger of a footprint, it's just gonna be slightly taller, you can now achieve that 150 GPH with 176 degree supply water temperature. You'd be looking at a Delta T in and around 50 degrees again, but you're gonna have a return water temperature about 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And this places it much better within the condensing range of a condensing boiler. So it just kind of goes to show that even though you can get away with a 42 or a 53 gallon tank, there can be cost advantages to the customer by upsizing to the 79, or in any case, you can upsize the tank a bit. And the standby losses on these tanks are so impressive that it, it'll definitely outweigh the standby losses of the extra water content. Inside the technical data manual, you will also see AHRI certified performance rating tables. The idea here being is this is a industry standard. It's standard IWHTS-1. So basically it allows you to compare different manufacturers tanks against the same rating standard. That standard includes a temperature rise of 77 degrees Fahrenheit, a boiler supply of water temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and a heating flow of 14 GPM. From there, you'll get what do you need to put in the tank for BTUs. You're going to get a continuous draw rating, a first draw rating, and a first hour rating. So continuous draw is, again, is as described as your continuous draw. This is your tank should be able to produce this all day long, so long as the proper conditions are met and everything's working great. First draw is the amount of usable storage inside that tank. So as mentioned, a, tanks are 82 to 97% can be drawn as usable water. Well, a 42-gallon tank, it works out to about the 82%, which works out to 34 gallons of using, usable water. So if you take that storage amount, you add it to your continuous draw, and that's how you end up at your first hour rating. Similar product data tables in the two coil tanks. I just want to point out that there will be a separate table for the upper coil and the lower coil. As well with the two coil tanks, you will get the AHRI certified performance ratings, but here you will notice they're rated with either the coils in series or the coils in parallel. What you will see is if you put the coils in parallel, you do get a slightly higher continuous draw rating, but there is a disadvantage as well. So if we take a look at this drawing, the one on the right shows the coils in series and the left would show the coils in parallel. So you, again, you're going to get a higher, you're going to get more power into the tank and a higher continuous draw rating if you put them in parallel, but the downside is you're going to end up with higher return water temperatures as well. As if you put the coils in series, you end up with significantly lower return water temperatures. And again, especially if you're working with a condensing boiler, this is going to improve efficiency. I'm sure there's some cases where if you were working with a non-condensing boiler, maybe you want those warmer return water temperatures, but just keep that in mind when you're setting it up and deciding which layout to go with. Continuing with some of the technical data, this table just shows you the insulation type, heat exchanger water content, heat exchanger surface area, 
your standby losses, as well as your tank connections. But what I would like to point out here is if you focus on these larger two tanks, the 79 and the 119, you'll see that the heat exchanger has a surface area of 16 and 18.3. If we move to the same table, but for the dual coil tanks, you will see the lower heat exchanger is 16 and 18.3. What I'm trying to point out here is it is the exact same heat exchanger in a single or dual coil tank that's at the lower coil. The dual coil tank just adds a secondary heat exchanger higher up in the tank. As far as recommended service clearances, these are here and specified out for access and proper ability to service the tank but there is zero clearance to combustibles from all sides and it can be placed on a combustible floor. Be mindful though, if you're placing this on a wooden floor or some sort of combustible floor, uh, for example, the 919 gallon tank is gonna weigh about a thousand pounds once it's full of water. As well in the product data, you will find pressure drop tables, one table for the primary side, the heating water side, and one table for the domestic water side. And what really impressed me about these vertical tanks is the low pressure drop across the heating coil. So if we take an example, we look at nine GPM. Now this is on the domestic water side. So if you think about it as a tank, really where's your pressure drop gonna be? It's gonna be your fitting in and your fitting out. It gives you about a foot head of pressure drop. Now, if we take that same nine gallons and we now it's on the heating side, so it's going through the coil, we're only looking at 1.5 feet of pressure drop. So only a 50% increase when going through the coil versus the tank. And I think that's really impressive. And what a lot of that comes down to is the fact that the coil is a continual spiral. It's also that larger diameter engine three eighths, but this continual spiral doesn't have a lot of sharp turns to create a lot of turbulence and pressure drop. Taking a look at the tank connections and what comes shipped with the tank. So items A, B, C, and D you see here do come shipped with the tank. They're part of the standard insulation set. A being the recirculation tap cap. B being the T that allows you to put in the pressure, temp and pressure relief valve. And then at the top of the T would be your domestic hot water connection. E is an optional solar elbow. And what this is for is so that if you want to use solar, you can thread a well in the back of the T here and then stick the sensor in the T and your solar return would then be connected to the top of that elbow. We got the TS for the clamping system. So I'll go into more detail on this new clamping system, but that's shown right there. DWH is your domestic hot water, of course. RT is your recirculation loop connection, if you would like to use that. You've got your boiler water supply, your boiler water return, and then your domestic cold also doubles as your drain when needed. Looking at this next table of dimensions, I, I, I don't show you this because I expect everybody to memorize this. This is certainly available at all times in the TDM or even in the flyer. I just want to point out that if you're looking at the older EVA tank, say you're taking an EVA out and replacing it with an EVB, there is in some sizes slight dimensional changes as to where the pipe connections are made. So don't assume that it will be a direct match. You will have to make some slight piping changes if you rigid pipe that. Looking at the tank connections on the two coil tank, well, A, B, C, and D, nothing changes. They're the same as well as E, TS1 and TS2. So now we have two places for the temperature sensor. Now there's two coils. So we have a lower temperature sensor and a upper temperature sensor. Again, you've got your domestic hot water connection at the top your domestic cold at the bottom. Now your lower coil is listed as your solar water supply and return, and your upper coil is your boiler water supply and return. Obviously these can be used in different applications. They're not just able to be used in solar water, but that's how it's gonna be labeled in the TDM. 
again, another dimension table, and I certainly don't expect this to be memorized. I do want to point out a couple things. One is that the doesn't list it on the table, but the tank width without the insulation is just under 24 inches. When you look at the TDM, it's listed down in the legend notes. Uh, the tank height without insulation for this one would be 74 and a half inches. So they label that as L at 77. If you remove the insulation, it goes down to 74 inches. And there is an asterisk on the table to indicate that the tilt height is without insulation. I just wanted to point that out because it, you might miss that asterisk and assume that, well, okay, well, if it's 78 with the insulation, I can get it a little lower. No, that's already assuming the insulation is off. As far as installing the insulation that comes shipped separate with the larger tanks. Again, this comes shipped separately. It kind of comes in a flat box and in the box you'll have the insulation as well as 12 of these clip sets. The idea is you're going to identify the back of the tank. So the front of the tank has the clean out opening in it. So you're going to find the back, you're going to install six of your clips evenly along the back and then clip them in just one notch. And then you're going to wrap it around the front. You want to make sure that it's best to use two people because it's big and you want to make sure you do it right. Then you're going to make sure that you're nice and even, that you're not higher on one side than the other. Then you're going to notch the front clips in one notch and then you're going to go around to back to the back, make them as tight as possible and then back to the front and make them as tight as possible. There is cover strips that go on after. And just be mindful that the tank thermometer does go in the cover strip. And you're obviously going to want to put that in and install it, as well as the boiler temperature sensor, the tank temperature sensor that's going to report back to the boiler. You want to make sure you install that before you put your insulation on as well. All of the tanks come with adjustable legs. They have up to two inch adjustment. Not much else to say there, but it is certainly a handy feature. We do have the new tank sensor mounting system. So they call this the plug and play sensor fixing system. And I'll try to break this down for you with the next graphic. But if you take a look here uh, in the next slide, they'll refer to the upper opening and the lower opening. So the upper opening is where you're going to insert the sensor and the lower opening is where you're going to use the thumb screws to hold the sensor tight to the tank. And this is just an image of, so your thumb screws would thread into there and take this little clip, or sorry, this little bracket, if you will, and push and squeeze the sensor to, tight to the side of the tank. So what is the process? Well, first of all, you're gonna to wanna to take the lid off the tank and the loose insulation mat out because that's where you're gonna find the thumb screws. Then you would take your sensor that would be shipped with the boiler or provided third party. You're going to insert it into the upper opening, slide it down until it bottoms out. Then you're going to take a thumb screw and screw it in to the corresponding spot. So there's one, two, three at the top to slide in and it'll be one, two, three on the bottom. So make sure you correspond it. And then that will push this little bracket which will squeeze the sensor tight to the tank. You want to make sure you get it down snug, but you don't want to over tighten it. So get it nice and snug and then give it a couple tugs to make sure it's in place. If you're using the wall thermometer, there is a well in the top of the tank. Uh, you'll see when I talk about the wall thermometer that they have a, uh, two sensor options. So one for the top of the tank or upper sensor, and then one for the lower sensor, which would be the side of the tank. So again, you're going to slide that into the little well that's on the top of the tank. You're going to use the clip to retain it in place. And then what you'll notice is in the top of the tank in the foam, they've left a little raceway. And then when you get to the actual jacket, they've got a little notch out as well as in the lid. So you're going to take your wire through that raceway, tuck it out the notch out, and make sure you line the lid up with that as well. And that's just another image of it. I wanted to show it after I kind of showed the illustration. So again, slide the wire on the top. These are tie wrapped down, which kind of makes it look a little misleading because it looks like the wire is going up, but that is going down. The sensor sitting in behind here and the thumb screw is holding that tight to the side of the tank. 
if you've got that, so that last one was for the 50, so 42, 53, and 79 gallon tanks. Those are the tanks that are pre insulated. Now, if you've got the 119 gallon tank in which the insulation is shipped separately, it's similar but slightly different process. So, what you will find is that the sensor mounting bracket is shipped loose or shipped with it, but it's not already attached to the tank. And there'll be two stub outs, two threaded stub outs on the side of the tank. You take the two nuts, you kind of thread them on loosely then you can slide the bracket over top it's kind of like hanging a picture you know the kind of hanging device that you see once it's in there then you're going to tighten the screws down to pull the bracket nice and tight with the tank once that is done then you can insert your sensor into the bracket clips and again there's spots for three sensors and again if you're using a thermometer and you want to have a sensor in the top of the tank it is the same process as with the previous tank there's a well in the top and you use the clip to hold it in place and again you're going to want to mount these sensors and pass them through the cover strip before you put the insulation on if you are utilizing the optional solar elbow it's a fairly straightforward process. You're going to thread the solar elbow onto the solar water return connection. And then you're going to take the well and thread that into the back of the elbow, slide the sensor in the well, and use the clip to hold it in place. Then from there, your solar water return connection threads to the top of the elbow. As mentioned, we have the wall thermometers available. So these are a digital display and they work off of batteries. It works off of two coin batteries. So you don't have to provide any power to the sensor. And the sensor has two uh, inputs to it or the wall thermometer, sorry, has two sensor inputs into it. And the idea being you put one sensor in the top of the tank and one tensor down low on the side of the tank. And then you can toggle back and forth between the upper sensor and the lower sensor by pushing the button on the front of the thermometer for five seconds. If you wanted to uh, switch from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you would push that button for 10 seconds. If you have a boiler that is not looking for a sensor input, an analog sensor input, yet is looking for a on off, open close, or a digital input, we have a Aquastat accessory available. It's a very simple process. You take a three quarter inch coupling. If it is a 52, sorry, a 42 or 53 gallon tank, if it's a 79 or 119 gallon tank, you would use a one inch to three quarter reducing coupling. Then you're going to thread the well in using the proper sealant provided and then install the bulb into the well following the instructions. And that gives you a adjustable range of 120 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Taking a look at some service. So if you wanted every, every once in a while, you're going to want to clean this tank out. So the process for cleaning the tank out is you're going to take the lid off, pull the insulation mat out. And then you're going to see the top cap, the clean out cap. If you got any sensors in there, of course, you got to pull those out because this is going to be threaded off and you don't want to twist all those leads up and damage those sensors. You get that cap off, then there will be a dome cover. You take, cover, sorry, you take that and set it aside. Under that will be a gasket. Now we recommend that the gasket is replaced with each service. So we show throwing that out and replacing it with new. If you're working with a 79 or 119 gallon tank, there will also be a lower clean out. Again, there's gonna be a cover. You take that off, a loose insulation mat. Now, instead of threading off, this is a flange with eight bolts in it. You take those bolts out. Underneath that flange will be a gasket. And again, that gasket should be replaced each time. Now that you've got access to the tank, one thing I should have mentioned is before you open the tank up, you're gonna shut your water off and drain the tank out. I forgot to mention that part. Uh, and obviously we want to make sure that we prevent any chemicals from entering the domestic water. So you're gonna to wanna to disconnect your domestic water connections as well. But once you've got the tank open, you got access to it, you can use a pressure washer to remove any loose debris and then follow that up with a chemical treatment using a chemical that is approved by Wiesman as per the service instructions.
And of course, if we're using chemical treatment, we want to make sure we very thoroughly rinse that tank when we're done. This slide just shows a very basic layout. And what I want to show here is the orientation of the pump. So in this particular example, we're assuming that this boiler is a high mass boiler. And the reason I say that is general rule of thumb is you want to pump towards the greater resistance. So with this being a high mass boiler, there's gonna be very little resistance or pressure drop across the heat exchanger in the boiler. Therefore, the tank coil is the greater resistance and we're pumping into the tank. Were we to switch this boiler out with, say, a Vito Dens wall hung boiler, which would have a larger pressure drop across the heat exchanger than across the tank, we would take this pump and it would pump be in the return pumping back towards the boiler. Quick overview of how we can employ these tanks in a solar setup. I'm not gonna go into much detail on the solar because we have Scott who's going to be doing a full on solar presentation in a couple of weeks. And I highly recommend you check that out if you're interested. I know I myself am looking forward to seeing it, but I will show how we can employ, employ these tanks in a solar setup or some of the common ways. So in this particular setup, what we're looking at is a, a preheat tank with a primary tank. So your solar is set up to reject its heat or heat up the preheat tank. And then the primary tank is set up with a boiler as backup. So again, the way this works is quite simple without going into too many details. So long as there is enough heat in the collector and a demand for heat in the tank, the Divicon will engage the pump, will pull the heat down from the collector. This is a glycol loop. So be mindful that some jurisdictions may require may not allow this, they may require a double wall brace plate heat exchanger in between because technically these heat exchangers are only single wall. So just be mindful of that. But again, if there's enough heat in the collector and a demand in the tank, we're gonna bring it on. We're gonna start rejecting that heat in the tank until it comes up to set point and then the pump will shut down. Then from there, anytime there is draw on the hot water system, like the domestic system, the water flows out of the preheat tank into the primary tank. And if need be, the boiler can heat that water up more. So say it's very cloudy and cold, but don't underestimate that these collectors can still produce a pretty good amount of heat in the cloud, but there will be times where it is just not enough. Therefore the boiler can produce that as backup. What you can run into in this situation as a downfall is that if you go for extended periods of time with no use of domestic hot water, the only way to get the preheated water out of the preheat tank and into the primary tank is by pulling off of the, the hot water. Somebody has to go in and draw a demand of hot water. So what could happen in extended periods of no draw is you could have plenty of heat in your collector, but the preheat tank is up to temp However, due to standby losses, the primary tank is losing temperature. Then in, that, in this setup, then the boiler would have to run to bring that primary tank temperature back up to set point. A solution to that is adding a optional tank blending loop. Now, in this case, if the primary, or sorry, if the, yeah, the primary tank drops in its temperature, instead of the boiler engaging, the recirc pump will engage. It will draw this cooler water out of the primary tank, place it into the preheat tank and the heated water from the preheat tank will go into the primary tank. And then the energy in the solar can be used to reheat the water in the preheat tank. And then you do not have to run your fossil fuel boiler to bring that water back up to temperature. One last example, using a dual coil tank. So when you're using a dual coil tank, the solar is almost always gonna go into the lower coil. And that's gonna, the goal is that will do the primary amount of the work. However, again, if you have one of those days where it's very cold and cloudy, your boiler can heat the water up using the top coil. Or if you have a long and large continuous draw, you can get both the solar and the boiler working together to give you increased continuous draw ratings. Taking a quick look at our horizontal tank offering. These are made of a stainless steel 24316. 
Again, the entire water haunt tent is heated. This time it's with an inch and a quarter coil, but because we're heating the entire water content all the way to the bottom, we again can draw 82 to 97% of the water at a usable water temperature. And the coil is again, vented upward, self venting to prevent air locks. With these tanks, they can be stacked. So the 120 gallon tank can be stacked as many as three high and the 92 gallon tanks can be stacked as many as two high. These are able to be used in steam applications up to 15 PSI. And we can take the jackets off and strip them down for easier handling and better access into the mechanical rooms. The warranty on the horizontal tanks is exactly the same as the warranty on the vertical tanks, so nothing changes there. And again, you're going to find very similar tables in the product data. We already explained how this one works. When you get the PDF of the presentation, I include a lot more of the all the models and the tables and whatnot. I just wasn't going to bore everybody with every little product data table in this presentation. And again, you're going to get your pressure drop, pressure drop tables. And now what you'll notice here uh, between the vertical tanks and the horizontal tanks is there's a, definitely a bigger pressure drop across the heat exchanger side. So in this example, I'm laying out uh, nine or sorry, uh, 15 GPM on the uh, domestic water side, we'll follow that up. And we see that'll give us a pressure drop of well, probably approximately five inches water column. Well, if we take that same 15 GPM and throw it through the heat exchanger side, well, now we're looking at a pressure drop of say 55-ish inches water column. So it's about a 10 times difference pressure drop through the coil than through the tank as we're, when we were looking at the vertical tanks it was only about 50% more. A lot of that comes down to the shape of the heat exchanger. It is a slightly uh, thinner tube at inch and a quarter versus three, three inch and three eighths. But more importantly, it's the, the just the nature of the heat exchanger in the horizontal tank is kind of like square coil. So at every turn, it kind of hits a 90 degree bend and creates a little more turbulence. And that's certainly not a knock on the uh, horizontal tanks. What that is, 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 a, is an attaboy to the, vertical tanks and how impressively low the pressure drop is across them. Again, you're going to get into some dimension tables. Just want to point out that these are the dimensions with the enclosure removed. Okay, so just don't look at that and think, oh, okay, well, he said you can take the jacket off too, so I can get it even smaller. No, that is with the enclosure already removed. And again, you're gonna find a table that gives you the dimensions to each of the tank connections. Not a lot to point out here. What I will say is you'll notice that there is a dedicated well for an aquastat or a sensor, as opposed to having to share the uh, recirc pump tapping like in the vertical tanks. Another difference is, is the TP valve and the, the recirc tap are the shared connection and the domestic hot water is on its own. All of our tanks can be installed in a group of tanks or a battery of tanks in a parallel piping situation. Uh, and when you do that, you want to either be piping them in reverse return or using balance valves or even better yet, both. And if anybody's not familiar with a, what a reverse return piping is, it is essentially just a way of piping it so that you get as even as possible of a pressure drop across all the tanks. So you're pulling evenly from all the tanks. So in this particular example, we come in on our supply. Our first tank fed is here. Well, if we look at the return, that's actually the last tank coming off the return line. And that's how you do your best to even out the pressure drop across them. These boilers in the horizontal do have plastic grommets where the pipe passes through the casing. And if you're having water temperatures in excess of 203 degrees or 95 degrees Celsius, we want to make sure we remove those grommets because they're getting to the point where they may melt. Installing the sensor well on these tanks, 
So it comes as a kit with the tank, and there will also be a sealant. So you're going to install the reducing coupling and then thread the well into said coupling. And then from there, you will follow the instructions with whatever boiler control you're working with. So uh, like our boiler controls that, I, that I'm familiar with that are often paired with this will be shipped out with a sensor and you'll actually get a little rod and a little spring clip. And the idea is that you place the sensor at the end on the little spring portion of it. And then you use the rod to slide it down the end of the, the sensor well, because it's a 15 inch deep well. And then the spring helps push and keep the sensor nice and tight to the side of the well. The horizontal tanks can be used in steam applications of up to 15 PSI and no warmer than 250 degrees Fahrenheit. In that case, you're definitely going to want to remove those plastic grommets. And you need to make sure that your steam side control regulates the, D the tank temperature to no greater than 210 degrees Fahrenheit or 99 degrees Celsius. So, there's probably re many reasons that the vertical tanks are not certified for use with steam and the horizontal ones are. I don't want to say it's just limited to what I'm about to point out, but one of the most obvious things that comes to play is if you look at the vertical tank, the coil comes down to the bottom of the tank and then back up and out. Well, this would create a unintended condensate trap if you were using this in a steam application, as where the horizontal tanks the heat exchanger continues downward and it's a constant sloping direction out that we can get any condensate out and into the proper condensate trap. As far as cleaning the horizontal tanks is concerned, it's not all that different than the vertical tanks. You're gonna take the cover off, remove the insulation and unthread the cap. Under the cap will be the dome cover, which you save and then dispose of and replace the gasket. Again, you're going to shut the water off, drain the tank, make sure you remove any domestic connections so you don't end up getting chemical in the domestic water. You're gonna use a pressure washer to remove any of the loose debris. And if there's a bunch of stubborn sediment left, then you can use the approved chemical cleaner. Again, always, if we're using a chemical cleaner, we want to very, very thoroughly rinse that tank out. As mentioned, the horizontal tanks are stackable. So for the, this process, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to set down your bottom tank and you're going to make sure it's nice and level. Then you're going to prep the next tank to sit on top. The first time I looked at these instructions, I was kind of like, well, why do, what is going on here? Why do I have to pull the insulation mat off and pull this sensor out? Well, then I realized that really because this is a this sensor has a capillary and that's attached to the thermometer, which is on this front door. So the reason for these portion of the instructions is just simply so you can get the front door off out of the way and then get the side doors off. Once you've got the side doors off, you're going to remove the leveling, oh, you're going to remove the leveling legs. And then you're going to use four of the supplied bolts to bolt it down to the bottom tank. And if you are stacking them three high, like you got 119 gallon tanks and you want to go three high, you would just repeat that step for the next tank. And then obviously put your sensor back in and put your door panels back on. All right. I'm going to finish this off by attempting to go through some explanation of some of the sizing tools we have available. So I'm going to go through three tools. Uh, two of them are software-based tools found on our website. And one of them is a graph that you find in the technical data manual. So the first one I'm going to go through, the OT method. I won't go into as much detail on this. This is more geared towards engineers for residential apartment buildings. But this method addresses specific occupancy types, hence the OT. So it addresses specific occupancy types by separating them into three categories, low, medium, and high DHW demand. Then each category is assigned a storage capacity factor and a continuous demand factor. And they use historical data from many, many multifamily buildings that they've been tracking over time to determine what demographic belongs in which bucket. So I've run this through our software to give a quick example. 
So I do one example where I use a low demand demographic. I say that there is four one bedroom units, four two bedroom units, four three bedroom units for a total of 12 apartments and 36 occupants. And the software comes back and tells me I can get away with a single 53 US gallon tank. Okay. Well, if I was to use this exact same occupant numbers, but change the demographic to high demand. So again, I've got four, four, and four for a total of 12 units, 36 occupants. Now under high demand, you can see that I need 219 gallon tanks. So that's actually four times the amount of capacity and storage that it's recommending for me. The method that I tend to gravitate towards, and again, this is software on our available on our website, is the ASHRAE Average Hourly Demand Method. So in this method, we determine the total gallons per hour demand of all the installed fixtures in the building. Then we apply a simultaneous usage factor that is based on building type to determine the max hourly demand in gallons per hour. Additionally, we then take this max hourly demand and apply a storage factor that is also based on building type. So what I mean by building type, as you can see on our website, you have the options of apartment buildings, club, gymnasium, hospital, hotel, etc. So I lay out two examples, one I pulled off as gymnasium and the other as a private residence. What I will point out is you do tell the software which tank size you're looking at your boiler supply water temperature, and your boiler supply flow rate. As you can see, the gymnasium has a capacity factor of one and a demand factor of 0.4, as were the residence, a private residence is seven and 0.3. Well, if we think of a gymnasium, let's say after a spin or kickboxing class, you're likely to have a bunch of people maybe heading down to the shower at the same time, could even be a lineup for the shower. So you're going to see uh, a lot of your fixtures experiencing a long demand for, uh, for an extended period of time. Therefore, the higher the higher factors are used to compensate for that. So in these next couple of slides, I'm gonna to try to break down the math that goes down in the background of the software. You do not need to understand this to use the software, but if you're like me, you like to understand the math that's going on in the background, especially as I can imagine when you're putting some of the information to the software, there is going to be some approximations you're making. And for me, if I'm making approximations, I want to know exactly how much influence those are gonna have on the outcome and in which way. So the first thing, so what you'll see is you, you put all that information in, so as I shown you in this last slide, and then it's going to tell you the tanks to, to use, and then you're going to get this sheet here. It's going to show you all the math that it kind of, or all the numbers that it came up with. So again, let's start out with how does it figure out the max hourly demand? What is the math behind that? Well, that is calculated as a sum of all fixtures in gallons per hour times the demand factor. So in this particular example I laid out, we have 154 GPH, it's a private residence. So we're looking at a demand factor of 0.3, and that is where the 46.2 US gallons comes from. Another number that they give us is building required recovery rate. Well, this one's actually quite simple once you figured out the GPH. This is just GPH represented as GPM. So we take our 46.2 gallons per hour divided by 60 and we get 0.77 GPM. Minimum recommended storage volume. Well, this is calculated by multiplying the max hourly demand by the storage capacity factor. Again, this is a private residence. So our storage capacity factor is 0.7 times our 46.2 gallons. And that tells us we have a minimum recommended storage volume of 32.34 gallons. We also are given DHW load of the system. So what is your BTU requirements and BTUs, thousands of BTU per hour? Well, this is calculated as max hourly demand in gallons per hour multiplied by Delta T 
then multiplied by the good old constant 8.33, which we all probably know as pounds per gallon of water. So in this example, it doesn't show it on this page, but on the website, you would see that the entering water temperature they're assuming is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're looking at a set point of 140. So our Delta T is 90. And we take our max hourly demand of 46.2, multiply that by our Delta T, by our good old constant, and we would get a BTU requirement of 34,363, or sorry, 636. It's a good old Mazda car. And that would give you, they round it up to 35,000 BTUs. When you look at the software, they make the recommendation on two points. So you get a recommendation based on number of tanks using required recovery rate and number of tanks using minimum recommended storage volume. And it is possible to get a different recommendation. And I did in the example I laid out here. So this is an actual example. I created this on the website and then took out the screenshots. So what you will see is I selected a 53 gallon tank a boiler supply temperature of 158 degrees and a flow of 4.4 GPM. So how are these figured out? How do they come up with those numbers? Well, let's start with the minimum recommended storage volume. So the number of tanks is equal to the minimum recommended storage volume divided by usable tank volume. Well, we know it's a 53 gallon tank. And as mentioned, we got 82 to 90 seven percent usable volume i happen to know that this 53 gallon tank has about 85 percent usable volume so 85 percent of 53 gallons works out to 45 us gallons so that's what's usable storage inside a tank and they're giving us a minimum recommended storage volume of 81.69 in this example so i take my 81.69 divide it by the usable volume in a single tank and that would tell me I need 1.8153 gallon tanks. Of course, the software is going to round that up to two tanks. The other method or the other uh, populated amount of tanks it gives you is based on building's required recovery rate. This one's a little more involved. So it's building required recovery rate divided by available DHW for duration of peak time. And that's the kind of the key statement there is available DHW for duration of peak usage. So we'll break that down. Again, I selected 158 degree water temperature at 4.4 GPM. So, and we know based on the product data, which is, this is in the product data that you could find on our website, but the software automatically spits out this product data for you in the report. So I can see that that would give me a single 53 gallon tank at those 158 and 4.4 GPM would give me a continuous draw rate of 86 gallons per hour. Well, I want to flip that into GPM. So I take that and divide it by 60 and I got 1.43 GPM. So that's what I can continuously pull off that tank all day, even once the storage has been exhausted. And again, I've got my 53 gallon tank. I know that it's 85% usable. So now I have 45 gallons of usable storage and I have I can ration that out over the duration of peak usage, which I have selected as one hour. So then I take that 45 gallons, divide that by 60 minutes, and now we have 0.75 GPM. So we've got our constant draw of 1.43 and we have a ration amount out of the storage over an hour of 0.75 for a total of 2.18 GPM available GPM for peak usage time. This is greater than the building required recovery rate. So the software would tell me a single 53 gallon tank can work. Now, if I change this slightly, and now let's say I change my peak usage time to two hours, well, this math doesn't change. That tank is still capable of producing 100 or 1.43 GPM at 158 and 4.4 GPM. My 85% usable tank factor doesn't change. What does change though is duration of peak usage. This is now increased to 
two hours. So I still have the same storage volume, but I now have to ration this out over 128 minutes for 0.375 GPM. I add that with my continuous draw. I end up with 1.8 GPM available over two hours. So my software is going to round that up to two tanks. I hope by going through that, I was able to kind of explain to you why I think it's key to understand the math in the background. If you're making approximations to understand, you know, what the numbers are coming out as and what kind of safety factors you want to put in there. You can see something as little as changing the uh, peak duration time from an hour to two hours, which is something you're going to approximate most likely can make a difference in the amount of tanks it recommends. The last one I'm going to burn through here is the old chart in the TDM. So what this chart tells you is you've got your gallons per hour. I like to speak in GPM, so I've just converted this one spot to GPM. That's down here. Then it tells you the amount of BTUs required to get those gallons per hour. And then you've got on the egg diagonal from left to right, various flow rates. So 2.4, 3.3, and so on, up to 11. And then on the diagonal from right to left, you've got your required boiler water temperature and across the bottom, your expected delta T. So for this example, I'm going to say that I need two GPM. That's my required, uh, per, my required continuous draw rating for my application. So I can see immediately by going to the left of the table, I need 102,000 BTUs of input. For this example, to kind of explain how I go through this, I'm going to pretend like I'm using 120,000 BTU Vito Dens 100 wall hung boiler. So I like to enter the table at the right and come across to the first flow intersect line. So I do that here. I can see that I intersect at 2.4 GPM, but that would require a water temperature of about it's called that 140, 100, sorry, 240, 245 degrees Fahrenheit, way in excess of what my Vito Dens boiler is set up to do. Come to the next line of 3.3 US gallons, come across and see my temperature line, required supply temperature. Here I'm looking at about 220 degrees. This is still too much for my wall hung Vito Dens. Go to the five gallon line, come across, I'm about 200 degrees, still too high. Get to the 6.6 .6 US gallon lines, and that works out to almost exactly 194 degrees, which is actually within the domestic water production range of that Vito Dense boiler. So I could pick that flow rate of 6.6 .6 US gallons. I would expect to see a delta T of about 33 degrees and there would be a pressure drop of about 0.5 feet so that's also listed up here so along with your u.s gallons i'm sorry i'm looking at the wrong line so this was a 6.6 .6 u.s gallons you will also see i know it's hard to see up there but it does give you an expected pressure drop at that flow rate as well so that one would work but it's a bit on edge so i'm going to take myself across to the next line and i can see that if i fed it 11 u.s gallons I'd be looking at about 176 degrees required water temperature, a delta T of about 19, and a pressure drop of about one foot. Now, I, I laid out this example of 120,000 BTU Vito Dents. I would have to go back and look at the specific product data for that, but I'm going to say 11 GPM is too much. You're not going to get that out of the pump in that boiler. You're going to get more than 6.6. .6. I would guess it to be around maybe the 8 to 9 GPM depending on your total foot of head resistance. So then from there, you could extrapolate that out and figure out at your max flow of that boiler, what approximately you're gonna need for boiler water temperature. But at least you can know that their system is capable of doing it before you install it and tweak it out from there. I like to thank everybody for their time. Uh, if you're at all interested in checking out more videos or more training seminars, keep an eye on our Vsmin Academy website for more online seminar opportunities. As I mentioned, Scott has a solar seminar coming up. And we also have a YouTube North America, so Vsmin North America YouTube page. And we've got well over 175 videos on there across all of our product line. 
a lot of short how-to videos, some longer seminar recordings, so lots of nice information on there for each of the products. Did we end up with any questions? Um, all got answered. There were pretty simple questions. Oh, okay. Anything new you one. wanted I to add? New one. Hey, I got a new one. Okay. Does a new 444 stainless steel have a range value of chlorides uh, that most customers have well water? Uh, yeah, there is a, value, a range for that. It is in the technical data manual. I don't know what the number is off the top of my head, but the uh, uh, freshwater uh, specification is in there, but it's pretty wide. Um, I know that yeah, as stainless mentioned, steel that handles even... a lot more chlorides than, than the, the mild tanks ever did, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they, they, as mentioned, that 444 has an even improved ability to handle resist corrosion and chlorine too. So no other questions? Outstanding. Well, that's all I have right now. Perfect. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. Did you or Scott have anything you wanted to add? Well, just thanks, Curtis. I was, didn't have to do anything today except type oh. a few answers. So that was kind of, <laughs> I, I know it's not. I, and Scott just sat and drank coffee. Yeah. Tea actually, I switched oh, to tea at tea, some point. Switched to tea. Oh, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know it's, it's not it's exactly it's like the, almost lunchtime there. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It's it's certainly not exactly the most exciting topic, but I, I think it helps to understand some of the the what's going on in the background and the in the technical data on the tank. So I hope that was at least worth something. And if there's any of the math or anything that uh, I went through, it was too fast, but you're curious in it, just remember that we're going to post this, uh, likely post the recording to the website as well. You can get a PDF of the presentation and kind of look at it in slow motion for yourself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, make sure that you guys uh, pop in for, for Scott's in a couple of weeks on solar because uh, the domestic hot water tanks and the solar kind of work as a team. You know, you can you can get a lot of value out of out of using the solar with domestic hot water. Yeah, I, I appreciate Curtis teeing it up for me here today. So that was a uh, excellent presentation on on these tanks. And we talked. I think we talked before we started this whole thing. This was the first one that uh, the, the 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 bravest instructor is the newest guy because it's been 14 years. I've been with Vspin and we haven't done a tank presentation, so it was long overdue. It was an excellent. So I, I know I'll be going through this one uh, in my spare time to go through those sizing and uh, that that side of it was really I found pretty interesting actually is to to kind of lay all that. You went into out, a so. lot more detail on it than I did. So absolutely, tanks so much, Curtis. I had to. I was, oh, I'm, I'm, oh, that's I'm waiting oh, to that's say bad. that like for an hour now. Oh, so, that's that's good. That's good. Yeah. Well. Your well, I got all kinds of them, man. I got over thirty minutes worth of them, but I won't. I'll, I'll I will. I'll save the. Uh, I'll save for the the next tank presentation. Perfect. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.